wrote, among other books, of course, the monumental Christianity versus liberalism in the 1920s. Machen lay dying New Year's Day, 1937. And the last thing we know he did before he died was he had a telegram sent to one of his professorial colleagues, John Murray, at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And Machen said, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. The active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. When you lay dying one day, may you likewise cling to Christ and not only trust in but rejoice in his active obedience. In theological terms, we speak of both Jesus' passive obedience, for instance, when he is dying on the cross, but also, pivotally, his active obedience in which he moves in the direction of his fully sufficient redeeming work for us. And we've come today to what I consider one of the most important verses in the entire Bible, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. You need to remember this verse as you look at all the Gospels and all the flow of the Gospels, we're certainly now as we move into what is commonly called the journey to Jerusalem major segment of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And I'm almost tempted to ask us all to stand just to hear these words. This, this is power-packed. Then it came to pass, as the days were being fulfilled, that's literally the, the language in the Greek that's going on here, for what? What were the days being fulfilled in the direction of? Well, the actual terminology that Luke uses here, which is, this is a unique noun in the entire New Testament, but it links with the times all the times Luke is going to use the anolambano verb to be taken up, specifically referring to Jesus' ascension into heaven. So Jesus is, as the book of Hebrews chapter 12 says, Jesus scorns the shame and looks ahead through the cross to when he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. This is saying the same thing. It came to pass as the days were being fulfilled for his ascension. What does he do? Well, here is the ultimate active obedience, the ultimate pivot that leads to your salvation, the obedience, the faithfulness of Jesus to God's providence, God's plan for the future, your future, his future. He does what? He fixes, he sets his face to go to Jerusalem. Without wavering, he's going to keep his focus on his destiny and your salvation and ultimately his glory in the ascension. That's, that's what this passage is telling you. He fixed his face to go to Jerusalem. And this is, we'll come back to this more, but this is Speaking of fulfillment, pulling on all kinds of scripture that prophesies about this. For instance, just one that I want to highlight to you. I preached on this about three years ago when we were preaching through Isaiah. Let me remind you of it. The third servant song of the sequence of the four servant songs in Isaiah. Now, you'll know the fourth servant song. It's the one with five stanzas that I talk about all the time where he's led to the slaughter. Uh, like a lamb. He's pierced for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. But notice that great massive climactic song of Isaiah, the fourth of the four servant songs, is in first person plural. So it's from our perspective. Go back to the third servant song, which leads into the fourth, anticipates the fourth, prophesies the crucifixion, prophesies Jesus' rejection and suffering by the people. But notice this one. This is in first person 
singular. So we are hearing from the servant, in other words, from Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 50, just picking up at verses 6 and 7, hear the servant speak. I gave my back to those who strike. Can you see the crucifixion going on here, okay? The passion. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. You remember when they spit on Jesus, right? Okay. Why? Verse 7. Because Adonai Yahweh helps me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Hebrews 12, 2, right? Scorning the shame. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. Polomish. Rock. Hard rock. And I know that I will not be put to shame. That's the prophecy 700 years before Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And it's right there in the third servant song. So we're talking about an incredible Savior, the Son of God, your Savior, the one who invites you to go with him in his active obedience to his destiny, his mission under God's sure providence and in fulfillment of his Father's perfect timing and telos, end, end point, okay, fulfillment for the gospel. I have set my face like flint. Now notice the, the connection here. Luke 9, 51. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. But here's the thing I want to ask you and me in application. Ask yourself this. Is my focus fixed on God's will for me right now? My purpose, my finish line. In other words, as you head into Sunday afternoon, is like the Super Bowl really the big deal for you today? Or do you serve someone in something bigger than that? As you, as you head into school or work or whatever your retirement activities or non-working activities are on Monday, Tuesday, what's your plan? Where are you going? What is your destination? Because see, if you know what God's will is for you and your plan, you're going to make decisions. You should make executive decisions. If you don't, it's sin, right? So not only to put to the side bad things, but also sometimes even good things that aren't the best thing, right? They don't further your progress towards where you've got your face fixed. Now, if your face is not fixed, you're just kind of wandering around. And whatever pops up on your phone, somebody calling you, some you know, Instagram pop or whatever, you're going to be distracted the whole day long. You won't be going anywhere except you're just kind of like a feather in the wind. But Jesus is not a feather in the wind. His face is fixed like hard rock on exactly where he's going. Are you fixed like that? Should you be? Yes. If you're following Jesus, yeah. Well, I'm not Jesus. Yes, I know. But he gives you the power of his spirit in you when you call on him. So... Speaking of moving ahead, the Apostle Paul famously says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You want a theme verse for your life? You want to know where, how you need to be prioritizing and heading? Choose Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. But wait a minute, I liked it like 30 years ago. I want to sing the same songs in church or in my car that I loved like 40 years ago. And Paul is saying, look, forgetting what is behind. I'm, I'm interested in like the future, the kingdom, Paul says. If you want to get kind of like the Israelites who wanted to go back to Egypt. Remember this six weeks after they're out of Egypt being slaves. They're pining about the good old days back in Egypt. <laughs> and when Jesus is looking ahead to his exodus in Jerusalem, he's saying, come on, boys, be with me. I have no idea. Well, I kind of do have an idea why Jesus wanted those guys to go with him because it would have been so much simpler for Jesus just to go do it himself. See, he's calling them into this journey that they might learn and be witnesses 
and learn how to carry on the mission, to live their lives as Christians. And so he's inviting us. That's why Luke's gospel is written like it is. Forgetting what lies behind. Lord, please open me to face the future. It's your future. And open me to move forward toward your future with you and in you, Jesus. Please. Amen. So let's forget what lies behind and strain toward what lies ahead. Todd Bolsinger, in his really now classic book that pretty much sets the tone for leadership guides in the 21st century. He wrote it, most of you will know, for Christians and Christians involved in lay and clergy ministry. It's pretty much de rigueur in any kind of serious seminary training now on the practical side of theology. Canoeing the mountains. Canoeing the mountains. Christian leadership in uncharted territory. Now he was saying this, of course, like eight years ago, and it's even more so now on the other side of COVID. But you can't canoe the mountains. So he tells the story. You may remember the story if you know your American history about Lewis and Clark. They couldn't canoe through the Rockies, right? There was no river pass, but wait a minute. In our, the way we've always done things back in Europe and in Virginia, sooner or later, if you carry the canoe, you're going to find the river that cuts through, right? And that's the way you do your transport. That's the way you do everything. But when Lewis and Clark got to the Rocky Mountains, now catch this, it's the same name, right? Blue Ridge Mountains, mountains. Rocky Mountains. So we assume the way we've always done mountains is going to work, right? Only, are the Rocky Mountains like the Blue Ridge Mountains? No. Very different kind of mountain. Totally different world. So when they get there, there's no river pass. What about just paddling harder? Doing, kind of drilling down on the way we've always done it. Just do it harder. More, more angrily, maybe. Beating at the air with our paddles, is that going to get you through the Rocky Mountains? No. Not what they'd always done in Virginia. It wouldn't work out there. So what did they need to do? They needed to do something to their canoes, and they needed to be open in some kind of way to face the future. Well, they needed to leave behind their canoes. You know the story. You remember they end up ditching their canoes. That's that's not what they need. And to be open to learn new ways. These really experienced, cool leaders have to listen to a 17-year-old Native American young woman, Sacagawea, right, to figure out how to do this. Are you willing to listen and learn something new? <laughs> that's, what they, this is, so that's, of course, Bolsinger's basic entree into canoeing the mountains. Uh, Jesus is taking his disciples with him to Jerusalem so that they can witness and learn new things, how to face the future with hearts, hands, and agendas humbly open to God's providence. So back to our, our points now. First, face the future with hearts and hands and agendas. It can't be your agenda now. You've got to have an open calendar here. Humbly open to his providence. Uh, we're seeing this in Luke 9, 46 through 56, and definitely it's going to continue in the passage Dean is preaching next week. Uh, first of all, pride, internal infighting is a problem. The disciples, immediately after failing to deliver the demonically possessed boy, you remember Jesus has to do it, now they're immediately after this, how funny is this, arguing about which one of them is the greatest. But that's the world they lived in. Uh, This is going to be a chronic problem for the apostles. We're going to see it all the way through the Last Supper. You may remember this. We'll hit this in Luke way down the road. After Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, what do they immediately do? They start arguing about which one of them is the greatest. (laughs) Again, that's all the way in Luke 22. But Jesus, in this case, back in Luke chapter 9, takes the child, puts him at his side, one of these child teachings by Jesus. And Jesus says, notice that the people who follow Jesus include families. If you caught this, there's always children around. It's very interesting. But anyway, Jesus takes a child, 
and says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. In other words, God the Father. For the least among you all is the one who is great, the one who doesn't claim any prerogatives, the one who's not positioning to be the, the main dude or the main girl is actually the one who's great. The one who empties himself to follow me is the one who's great. My professor, he actually was my professor when I did Greek and also New Testament Greek and exegeted Luke, love David Mesner. He has this great line in one of his early articles on this section. This section of Luke is kind of his forte. There's no point in being at Jesus' side unless one is humble enough to be at a child's side. Then we have this other pride issue of territorial jealousy, and that's going to circle back around in another way in a little while. But, you know, John tries to kind of justify himself after this child teaching by Jesus and says, hey, but we were really good, you know, because some guys were, they were casting out demons in your name, but they're not one of us. So we tried to stop them. And Jesus says, do not stop him, this one who's casting out demons in my name. For the one who is not against you is what? For you. This echoes from when Joshua comes to Moses in, in the book of Numbers in chapter 11 and complains about some other people prophesying in the camp of Israel. And Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets so that the Lord would put his spirit on them. I'll come back to this later when we get to Luke 11. This is not in conflict with Jesus' other statement that you may kind of be remembering here. I want to point out the distinction briefly to you. Jesus says there, whoever is not with me. Do you catch that? I've got it bolded for you so you can catch it. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Here, notice, it's just talking about the group of apostles. So it's... Second person plural. Do not stop him for the one who is not against y'all is for y'all. Now let's move on to the center here. Secondly, face the future with no delays or excuses, but one with Jesus' first of all, his exodus and ascension in Jerusalem. Secondly, his mission for us that goes out from Jerusalem. And thirdly, one with Jesus' ultimate return to Jerusalem. Face the future, no delays or excuses. I, I know we're all good at delays and excuses. This, you should be getting this. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. One with Jesus' exodus and ascension at Jerusalem. He sets his face to go to Jerusalem. Let's look at this. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 2. Look at this passage. This is a passage of judgment, and it prophesies part of what Jesus is doing when he comes to Jerusalem. Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem. Do you see that? It's exactly the same language. And do what? Preach against the sanctuaries. What is Jesus going to do? He's going to come and bring down judgment on the temple and the temple system when he comes, okay? You remember this, Holy Week, okay? Preach against the sanctuaries, prophesy against the land of Israel. But Jesus is going to do more because ultimately he's going to bring redemption, which is why I want to highlight also the third servant song. Because the Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, helps me, therefore I will not be disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint. And it came to pass, as the days were being fulfilled for his ascension, and Alemseos, this is, again, this one time that we see this noun in the entire New Testament, but every other time when Luke uses the analambano verb, it has to do with Jesus being taken up to heaven. In other words, his ascension. For instance, Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The angel says, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven. Same term, okay? Uh, Acts 1, 21 and 22. So they're picking out a new 
apostle to replace Judas. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. In other words, when he ascended. They need somebody who can be a witness to all that. So face the future, no delays or excuses, but one with Jesus, not only his, his cross and ultimately his ascension from Jerusalem, but now look at this, one with Jesus' mission for us, beginning the mission from Jerusalem. Here, toward the close of Luke's gospel, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning where? From Jerusalem. And remember Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus commissions them and says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It all pivots. The axis point is uh, Jerusalem. We need to face that and be focused on that reality. Which brings us back to where is Jesus going to return? Is he going to just kind of flit up in the air and a few people get raptured and nobody knows he ever came? What do you think? No, the scripture is very decisive, repeatedly. Just like the angel says, in the same way he went up from you, he's going to come down from you. Where did he go up from? From the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. Where is he coming back? The Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, Zechariah chapter 14, Joel chapter 3. And then for a further and final application, third, face the future not in vengeance, but open to Christ wisdom and priorities. Should we get in every fight our anger tells us to get into? No. Is that foolishness? Yes. Is it a good priority if our faces are actually set towards where Jesus is going? No. In fact, it would be outright sin and an abomination to God the Father. Is vengeance mine? Have you ever read the Bible? What about my political party? What about the people that I like? What about my ball team? I don't know. Is vengeance mine? What does God say? Vengeance is mine. You be faithful to the path I give you. You are not the divine wrath, okay? <laughs> That's not your job. So here, <laughs> facing the future, not in vengeance. And I know today's culture really wants to stoke up all our anger and vengeance all the time. And I'm telling you, if you want to go with Jesus, it's stupid and it's misdirected. And notice this. Could Jesus have wiped out the Samaritan village if he wanted to? Sure. Is this village being bad to rebel against Jesus? Sure. But let's catch what's going on here. So the Samaritan village does not receive Jesus because, remember, they've got their own temple area. They reject Jerusalem, right? They broke off generations before. So they don't receive him. They don't welcome him because his face is set toward Jerusalem. Well, this is his calling, right? James and John, are, they're going to try to get themselves right again now. The sons of thunder, right? The sons of thunder. This is Jesus' nickname for these guys, the sons of Zebedee. He calls them sons of thunder. And they say, hey, do you want us to be like Elijah and rain down lightning and eviscerate the Samaritan village? That'd be really cool, right? And would, it would, would protect you, Jesus. These guys have been bad to you. Lord, do you want us to command the fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. In other words, Jesus has much bigger fish to fry. Do you follow me? And let's see where he's headed. Let me note to you, and it's in the NSV and ESV in a footnote. The King James and the New American Standard actually have this extra. A lot of the manuscripts have this. You do not know what manner of spirit you are, Jesus says to them. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. So let me put this in bold relief. And this isn't just about James and John. It can sometimes be about you and me when we're mad at people. James and John wanted to set fire to the Samaritan sinners. But Jesus stayed set on saving sinners 
via his divine destiny in Jerusalem. Isn't that awesome? Aren't you glad Jesus' main focus is not to turn to everybody who ever sins and wipe them off the face of the earth? Wouldn't be many of us around, would there? So, let's keep this in mind in these tumultuous days. I know the world's leading us elsewhere, but I want you and me. Let's go with Jesus, right? Toward his future. So, Lord, please... I invite you to pray with me now. I'm going to say this prayer. Let's close with this prayer. Lord, please open me to face the future. It's your future. You're ultimately sovereign. And open me to move forward toward your future with you. I want to go with you, Jesus. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville.